children who just got their Bible would mark this passage that we read about the importance of the Bible today. Wasn't that great? Seeing the children receive their Bible. And what a nice addition to have the children reading their Bible and marking their Bible. So when we come to the blessing of the Bibles later in the spring, they'll already have a, a, a Bible already well used and broken in. Let's go to our Lord with a word of prayer, asking him to open the scriptures to us. Father in heaven, we ask you today to show us that this book is not just any book, but a book through which you give us your grace. It is a means of grace. We ask you, Father, to empower not only the young people who just received their Bible, to empower all of us to cling to the word of God, to memorize it, learn it, keep it in our heart, that we might always be near your means of grace, your means of salvation, your love, your mercy. We pray it in Christ. Amen. We are in John, the 19th verse. That's the 20th chapter of the 19th verse. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said these things, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven then. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Children, I would underline that. Congregants, if you are marking your Bible, that's certainly an important one to mark. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And I would mark that verse 31. Let's go to the Lord asking him to be with us in our study. Father, just as you showed yourself to Thomas, you show yourself to us in this book, your holy scripture. We ask you, Father, that we might cling to our Bible, not just with our hands, but also with our hearts, with our souls, with all that we are, that we might know life now and life forever in heaven. We pray it in Christ's name, and God's people said, amen. We are just now beginning our Lenten series of sermons called the Bring Your Bible to Church Challenge. And we're so thrilled that many of you did bring your own Bible to church, whether an electronic Bible or a physical Bible, as long as you have a Word of God in your hand, we are thankful. If you haven't built that habit yet of bringing a Bible, physical Bible with you to church, go ahead and challenge yourself through this Lenten period to start carrying that Bible in. Maybe just getting your hands on it would remind you that we need to be in the Word. There are a lot of Bibles around us today. You just go down the street to the bookstore, and there are thousands of books. When I was a kid, I don't remember the bookstores being so big. But today, the bookstores are just huge, and there's lots of them. And when you walk into the bookstore, you're just overwhelmed with the numbers of books there are. Here are a couple that were picked out by the New York bestsellers list. The Girl on the Train is a fiction and then we also have the nonfiction section in your bookstore. Here, a, a movie was made out of this book, The American Sniper. That's nonfiction. So you'll notice that when you go into any bookstore or any library, there's two basic divisions of books, the fictional ones and the nonfictional ones. Our book of the Bible is nonfiction, and yet it's even more than that. 
This book is not just any book. It is a bestseller and has been a bestseller for the last 500 years or so. It is, in fact, if you go to your publishing world, you will see the Bible still makes a lot of money for people who print Bibles. But that's not why we should have Bibles printed and consumed. Bibles are rather here for our good, our spiritual good, our spiritual life. So the Word of God is not just a bestseller, like you might see on the New York Times uh, bestsellers list. It is a way God gets his mercy and grace to us. And we like to call it a means of grace. So God could choose any way he wanted to. If he wanted to send the word out by email, he could have done that. If he wanted to make it into a movie, he could have done that. But he chose his delivery method to be literature, to be a word collected in the Bible and given to the world in all their various languages. So God chose to deliver his great means of grace, his message of grace, his message of mercy through this portal that connects us to God. It's much more than just a book. Here is a picture of a tunnel. And the tunnel connects one side of a mountain to another side of a mountain. This book is such a tunnel. It connects God in heaven to us on earth. It is the means by which God travels to us, works the miracle of faith in us, and saves us for all eternity. We are not disconnected from God today. There is a tunnel through the mountain of sin, and that tunnel's right here in the word of God. We would want to cling to such a great access point, wouldn't we? So here's my uh, very uh, uh, best effort to show how this might be to illustrate. So over here in 30 AD, there was a man named Jesus of Nazareth, a real historic person from a real geographic location. And he really got real Roman nails stuck in him to kill him on a real cross. These things really happen. And around 30 AD is when that happened. It wasn't the only person in the history of the world to be crucified. It is, though, the only person in the history of the world who was also God in every way. It was the only person in the history of the world who paid with his lifeblood for the sins of the whole world once and for all. It's a one-time, perfectly unique event that we are to cling to this very day. And during this season of the year, we put purple on the wall with these beautiful paintings. Thanks again to Floor for these gorgeous paintings, reminding us of what the cost was. That happened in 30 AD. The sins of the world were paid for. Jesus won the sins of the world. But it's not good news to us yet. Because I don't live in 30 AD. I don't live in Jerusalem. I live in Houston in 2015. So how do I get connected to the forgiveness of sins Jesus won for me? Because if I don't get connected to the forgiveness of sins Jesus won for me, it is of no use to me. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't benefit me. I need the forgiveness of sins somehow delivered to me. I need the Holy Spirit to affect me today. I need God's presence with me now in the modern sense in this worship service right now and every time I open Holy Writ. And that is exactly what happens through this word. This is my version of a tunnel and the grace of God coming through the word and that forgiveness showing up to sinful people like you and me. It doesn't matter that it's over around 2,000 years, not quite 2,000 years since Christ's death. God is not so limited. He has worked a miracle through this word to get us what he won for us at the cost of his own blood. Why should we have this Bible in our hand more times than not? Why do we want to cling to this word? Because it connects us with salvation in Jesus Christ. Let's look again at our text. It's about the cross, reminds us, peace be with you. Jesus said that. He said to Thomas, first of all, we already know about mercy. If you were the savior of the world, you just spent your whole lifeblood for the sins of the world, and one guy who'd been walking with you for three years couldn't get his act together and couldn't believe, you would think that you might come back, but not to have mercy. 
You'd come back to confront him. Thomas, what's your deal? Why, why can't you act, get your act together? All the other disciples understand this. No one else puts on this ridiculous uh, condition of touching my wounds and stuff like that. You have gone beyond the pale. You are condemned. But that's not how it goes down. How many of us should be in the posture of Thomas? Where God's done one thing after another after another blessing us, but we still don't really trust him. Really not so sure. And we have our own conditions that we're setting on God. If he does this and he does that, maybe I'll believe in him. And Jesus is merciful. And he comes to us and he shows us his wounds. Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. This is what we call science. His eyes, his physicality, his sensibilities were able to literally probe the wounds of Christ, identifying him as a real, actual person back from the dead, but a person who retained his wounds. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was God and came back from the dead, I'd get rid of the wounds. I would have used some first aid cream or some band-aids or something like that and got them all fixed up. You know, I healed people who couldn't walk. I made the blind see. You would think that he'd take care of his own wounds, but he doesn't. He keeps them so that Thomas can identify him as the guy who was killed on the cross for the sins of the world. And he continues to keep them to this very day so that when we go to heaven, we will identify him as the one who paid for our sins too. So Thomas gets to probe. He gets to have his conditions used. God in Christ bends low again to help a sinner see that God is loving. Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. You want to memorize that scripture. Let's just try it together. My Lord and my God. Is that too tough? Okay, because when your friends, the Jehovah Witness or the Mormons come around, they're going to say, Jesus is Lord. And you're going to say, hey, I know a scripture. He's Lord and God. And they're going to say, no. We don't have any of that. We don't believe that. We just believe he's Lord. So you want to remember this text. Because if you can remember what Thomas said, then you can get Jesus right. Get it biblically right. My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? The answer is yes. Blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. How, did, how, do, people, how do people believe in Jesus without seeing him? The disciples never had to do that. Jesus knows about you. Jesus is thinking of you and me, people who have never seen and been able to put our fingers into the physical wound of Christ, yet we come to believe how. How do we come to believe without seeing or putting our finger in the wound? God provides a way. He provides a means of grace, and that's what we hear about next. Let's read about it. The gold words are for you guys to read out loud in unison with me. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in the book. I wonder what he did. It'd be interesting if he made water into wine some more, or what did he do? But these are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. How do people come to believe in this Jesus risen from the dead who died for the sins of the world? This, they're written that's the portal. That's the means. This is how people get to know that information. This is how we probe the wounds of Christ. This is how we get satisfied just like Thomas did, and we believe by a miracle of God. This is our access point, and so we want to cling to it very, very much. We hear about this in other places in scriptures. For example, here in 2 Corinthians today, I used the King James version of this. Again, the gold words are for you to read with me. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and that committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation. The word of forgiveness. That's how we know God loves us. If we just studied nature, we wouldn't know that God loves us. If we just studied our internal psyche and conscience, we wouldn't know that God loves us. Loves us enough to come to someone like Thomas who doubted. We wouldn't know that, but the Bible reveals it to us. And so we cling to the Bible as a very means of grace. God transmits this grace to us through his word. So there are several means of grace. They all depend on the word. There's the word, 
and the sacraments. And the sacraments are nothing less than the word of God plus a physical element. Here, the word of God plus some water. Here, uh, the word of God plus some bread and some wine, all to deliver us the forgiveness of sins. We hear about this in something called the Book of Concord. (laughs) Some of you may not have heard of this book. Concord, maybe you've heard of Concord grapes or Concord wine. Okay. Harmony is what concord means. And our church way back 500 years ago or so said we need some harmony around here because there's a lot of disputing, a lot of fighting in the church. We're going to go to the word of God to find that harmony. We're going to proclaim that harmony. And that's why they wrote this book of concord. We read in that book about the Bible. To obtain such faith, God instituted the office of preaching, giving the gospel and the sacraments Through these, as through means, he gives the Holy Spirit who produces faith where and when he wills and those who hear the gospel. The gospel is the word that is contained in here that is a means of grace. It is a means through which we get faith. Faith is a miracle that is worked in us because of the word of God. This Bible is God's instrument in our life, and we want to cling to it very closely. Martin Luther goes on about this in the small catechism. Some of you had to memorize the small catechism before you could take the Lord's Supper in confirmation. And we learn things like this from this Martin Luther guy who lived 500 years ago. He talked to us about baptism. How could baptism be so great? Let's read about it. It is not the water that produces these effects, but the word of God connected with the water and our faith, which relies on the word of God connected with the water. If you happen to be in a Lutheran church, the word of God has been with you since your baptism. The word of God has been confessed as the way you've got faith and the way you're going to keep faith. So we should be the church that has the word of God with us as close as possible. I know in my own family... We have kind of a heritage, if you want to see it going in the meeting room, a heritage of Bibles. We have this Bible, it's as big as, that must weigh 50 pounds. It was handed down to me by people who came to Germany with only so many things. They only had maybe two sets of clothes. They had one set of shoes. And they had the most of the weight of their luggage was their Bible. It doesn't seem like right priorities. Seems like they got things really backwards, or maybe they had it exactly right. They carried that Bible all the way over. They didn't have it in electronic version. They clung to that word. We had a dear friend, my wife and I, Mrs. Early. She lived in Philadelphia. She was Czech. And she had in Czech the word of God in the middle of her house. It was a row house. You had to go past that point. And this big, huge Bible was there all the time. You couldn't go to dinner and you couldn't go out the front door without walking back and forth past the holy word of God. That's how our houses should be. That's how our lives should be organized, around the very word of God. Luther goes on about it. For without the word of God, the water is merely water and no baptism. But when connected with the word of God, it is a baptism. That is a gracious water of life, a washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Again, now in the large catechism, it is nothing else than God's water, not the water itself is nobler than any other water, but that God's word and commandment are added to it. What's the big deal about the watery stuff in church? It connects us to God's word. You are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who came up with that? Jesus did. We're just delivering to you the word of God. It is a means of grace, a way of connecting you with God's mercy and grace. Luther had a way of putting things, and here he's talking about the Lord's Supper and how it is connected to the Word of God. I don't think he's doing this very poetically here. It's kind of a rough language, but let's go ahead and ponder this. Here found in one of his commentaries as he's writing about uh, the, uh, the catechism. Now, no one can jam the Word down through the throat into the belly, for it must be comprehended through the ears and in the heart. But what does he comprehend in the heart? Through the word, just exactly what they say. Namely, the body given for us, which is spiritual eating. The word of God comes into us through the holy sacrament. The whole place is organized around the word of God. In the same book of Concord, we again read, we must firmly hold that God grants his spirit or grace to no one except through and with the preaching outward word. It is the devil himself whatsoever is extolled as a spirit without the word and the sacrament. 
If you hear me going on about my political beliefs or my favorite sports team, but I never refer to a word of God, you're entertained, I tell some great jokes, I juggle, I do some things that really make you smile, but I never tell you a word of God, that is not of God. That is not a church. That is something very different. Beware, because there's many entertainers but we want to be church here. This Bible has two big messages in it. It's a law message and a gospel message. SOS was a signal that was sent by early users of the radio back in the early 20th century. You're talking about 1902, 1903. Uh, some called it Save Our Souls. That was the abbreviation they thought SOS meant. And we're going to use that a little differently. The word of the law means shows us our sin. When we hear a word of the law from the Bible, it shows us our sin. In a minute here, we're going to confess our sins because we're going to be, uh, have been affected by the Bible and it had shown us our sins, so we confess them. But there's another word, and this word is the word that is the means of grace. It is the gospel, and the gospel shows us our Savior. This word is not about our selfishness. It's not about what we want. It's about God and what he has done for us, and it's pointing us away from ourselves to our Savior. That's why we have a big picture of a cross up here and not a big picture of me or you. There's not a big mirror in the front of church because it's not about you or me. It's about salvation and our Lord Jesus Christ. So our whole worship life here is organized around the word of God, the means of grace. Whether we use guitars and drums or organs and stained glass, it doesn't matter how it's configured. It needs to be configured upon the portal to connect with God, his word, and the extension of that word in his sacraments. So the word and the sacraments are the way we get connected with mercy in Christ. Here in Houston, there's a famous illustration. Maybe some of you remember Dr. Denton A. Cooley. Here in Houston... The, there was medical history made where a fake heart was created and a person received a fake heart into their body cavity. Now, there are times when people not only get fake hearts, they actually get another human heart and they have a, a full transplant. We had a teacher at our, one of the churches where I served in our Lutheran school who needed a full heart replacement. His whole heart was no good. He was going to die if he didn't get a new heart. They didn't have one just stock somewhere in a stock room, right? So he has to live for a while without the use of his heart. You see how that's a problem? So he gets one of these kind of kits right here. That runs into his heart, and this is circulating his blood. This is his heart. That's how he's living. That's how his blood is circulating. Here is our external heart. Because our sinful hearts are broken. They're no good. They're sinful. They're black with sin. They're set on selfishness. They're set on injury. They don't work for salvation. They're messed up. They need to be transplanted. We need a new life. We need a whole new heart. It's a radical surgery, and God's going to do it for us, and he's going to do it better than Dr. Denton A. Cooley ever did it. Here is that external heart. We are fully dependent on this means of grace for our life now and our life forever. It's this means of grace that confers the forgiveness of sins to us. It's this means of grace that gets us faith. It's this means of grace that strengthens us in this faith. It's this means of grace that connects us with this guy who died for the sins of the world, even to the point of showing himself to someone like Thomas. So let's conclude. Why should I bring my own Bible to church? Let's read one way of explaining this. Let's read the entire statement together. The gospel is a means of grace. Therefore, I want to have my access point to the gospel of Jesus Christ, my Bible, with me so that I too may believe in Jesus Christ and have life now and forever in his name. Would you stand and pray with me that God would move us to use our Bible as our external heart, as our lifeline to God? Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, we thank you for rendering us Holy Scripture through tremendous acts of sacrifice. Yes, uh, translators and scholars and authors and writers and scribes and people who have snuck the Bible into countries where it wasn't belonged, have brought it over as immigrants. All kinds of sacrifices have been made, but none greater than your own sacrifice as you died on the cross for our sins and then even were willing to humble yourself enough to show yourself risen from the dead even to the likes of someone like Thomas. Lord, help us as we handle the word to have the same result as Thomas, to handle the word like it is your wounds and then to walk away from the word saying, my Lord and my God. To see that this word is truly a means of grace, a portal to your grace and mercy, a portal to your very own heart. Now we ask you to give us true life through the means of your word. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.